Hello everyone and welcome back to Assyria TV. On today's interview, we will be meeting with Afram Yaqub, who just published his own book, The Path to Assyria. This is the book and congratulations for your new book, uh, Afram. It's uh, really amazing. Totally. Um, I have to say, when I started reading your book, at first I was a little bit hesitant. Um, I always think about historical books as a little bit dull. But I have to say, as I went through uh, the chapters, I was more and more interested in the book. So really, congratulations for your amazing book. Thank you. Um, can you tell us more about how did you get the idea of writing this book? Or where did the idea come from? Uh, it's, uh, it's a tough question, the first question. And uh, the idea for this book, ac actually, the origin uh, started maybe 20 years ago. Uh, it started with a simple question of why or how come. Uh, in being involved in the Assyrian political arena, I always uh, found myself asking, um, why don't I see any progress, any real progress, uh, mm. and uh, comparing with uh, perhaps other political movements, uh, it became uh, more and more evident that there's something wrong. Yeah. So this question of why, um, I, it always surfaced uh, in my mind and um, it became louder and louder mm -hmm. uh, until I, I couldn't l let it go. I had to find an answer uh, that I would be satisfied with, understanding mm -hmm. uh, really why do we as a nation uh, not progress uh, politically. Uh, and as a, as a political uh, national movement. Yeah. Uh, so I, I took it upon myself to really look into these uh, questions and try to find an answer. And uh, uh, it took me about a year to write the book. Uh, it was a, a difficult process because it a, it's a, deals with uh, some tough issues. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed it does, because uh, throughout uh, the book also I have, so I have seen how you have made your analysis about uh, the, the, the issue or the anatomy of our situation as uh, a nation. And I have noticed that you came with a conclusion of something called or a concept of um, a collective victimhood. So could you walk us through what collective victimhood means or what is this concept? Yeah. It's a central theme with throughout the book, uh, collective victimhood. It's a, it's a term used by psychologists, uh, political psych psychologists, mm. to describe a mental state uh, a group of people can, can uh, find themselves in if they suffer a trauma, mm. uh, which is due to a genocide or a massacre or uh, ongoing oppression. So it's uh, the discovery of collective victimhood uh, uh, is uh, relatively new. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists, scientists didn't know about this uh, 30 years ago, I, I think. Uh, and more and more they're finding out how it affects and how it has affected different uh, nations and ethnic peoples mm -hmm. uh, throughout history. Uh, and um, it, it's a central uh, part of the question mm -hmm. uh, answering why we as a nation haven't been able to progress. Uh, and um, for me, when I found out about the concept of collective victimhood, it was f like finding the last or most important piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, in being able to answer uh, why uh, we find ourselves in the condition or this state we find ourselves in today. Yeah, well, this concept is actually really new also for me and many others. And I think, like I've said earlier, while reading the book and I met this concept, it was, it was something that made me drawn to the book more, to know more about this concept. But also, I've seen that you go against many things that we as a nation know about our own history. And you claim that they are not true. And one example of that is the British betrayal. You say that the British did not betray us. And even though I've heard this many times, like in other Assyrian historical books or with our like parents and stuff, but you go against this claim. Why? Can you explain more? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a tough book to read for uh, uh, if you're an Assyrian and you've been taught to be proud of our modern history and you've been uh, um, you've been fed with a certain narrative about our, our struggle, uh, mm. it's going to be a tough pill to swallow. Mm. Uh, because none of the things that we, we've been told about ourselves mm. is actually true. Mm. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's not just that the British didn't actually betray us. Mm. Um, the genocide didn't have 
the consequence of the genocide aren't really what we have been told that it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Many things about us and uh, about our modern history, uh, we have to reevaluate them mm -hmm. uh, in order to start to see things uh, in a new light and understand ourselves uh, in a, new, in a new, new way. Mm -hmm. I think we have to do this, although it's, it's, it's tough, it's difficult, uh, it's challenging, uh, but um, you know, when we see that we're stuck where we are, mm -hmm. So there, m there must be something else. We have to, we have to uh, find uh, new answers. We have to try to think in new ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yes. So uh, do, do you think that because we are like told different story or maybe the other side of the story and I neglecting the facts is one of the reasons that the British betrayal did not happen or one of the reasons that our uh, success towards our goals did not happen. Is this what you're saying? I'm saying that uh, basically the way that we've come to see ourselves and understand our history mm. uh, has been and is still uh, dependent upon the, the mental state we find ourselves in, the, the, which is collective victimhood. Mm. We see ourselves, we understand ourselves and the outside world mm -hmm. thr through the lens of collective victimhood. So maybe it's good also to explain uh, more specifically what uh, the uh, concept of yeah. collect, uh, collective victimhood. It's it's a state where you you think that you've lost, you sense that you've lost lost Everything. your agency. Mm -hmm. you, you're powerless. Mm -hmm. You feel powerlessness yes. uh, about yourself, uh, and you feel that you can't really do anything to change your future or your current situation. And uh, that's why you look a lot uh, to, to have a savior, someone to save you. Mm. Uh, and um, you don't think that you own your own um, destiny. Yeah. Uh, so being dictated by this mental state, mm. uh, it, it shows how we've come to see the British action during mm. World War I as a betrayal. Mm -hmm. But it was not. Mm. Uh, we've come to see that we, we say that ge the genocide of 1915 uh, broke our back and it's it's basically the reason why yeah. we didn't reach our our uh, goals as a nation well other nations also suffer genocides uh, and massacres uh, sometimes perhaps uh, more severe than the one we suffered yeah. and they still progressed uh, politically True. in mm. different ways so uh, when you start to look beyond uh, when you when you take away the filter of, of collective victimhood mm -hmm. and you, s you, s you see through this and you start to see things in a, a new way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really true and I, I do agree. When I first read, I, I thought like I was, it was shocking for me because like I told you before, those informations are like part of our history and that what we know. And then knowing more this is the thing that I like about the book, that it has not just give you the, the historical facts, but the depth and the analysis of each um, historical point of our history. But you also go not just about history, but about the modern um, situation. And you talk about um, like there, there is no real um, armed uh, struggle for our nation or that we have been engaged in. All of them are now for us, can you uh, elaborate on this? Yeah, so in the book I use uh, different uh, methods to, to uh, reveal mm -hmm. how we've been, uh, our actions and our behavioral patterns have been dictated by the collective victimhood mentality. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I use warfare and armed struggle as a clear example because mm -hmm. it, it, it shows most uh, clearly uh, mm -hmm. how we've been dictated by this special condition mm. because if you look at our past 100 years of history uh, every time we've been engaged in some form of armed struggle mm. or warfare uh, it has been dictated by something else than our intrinsic uh, drive for independence mm. or nationalistic goals it's always been dependent upon, s upon something else mm. I give an example of f four different um, themes one is when we've had our backs against the wall and mm -hmm. we've been forced to, to you know, fight just to survive, mm -hmm. like some instances during the genocide of Seifu. And then uh, when we've had uh, s external support, like from the British or the French during mm. World War One, 
or when we've uh, had to fight because of the general context mm -hmm. and there's been a general fighting uh, or we've been forced into the fight mm -hmm. by other parties like in the 1950s, 60s in, in northern Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fourth is when um, we have been armed uh, by different parties, mm. uh, like we see different guerrillas in Syria and Iraq, uh, some organized and supported and, and initiated by Kurdish groups, yes. and some others not. But they, they all, all of these different uh, situations uh, reveal that we haven't really uh, armed ourselves and waged armed struggle mm. for our own uh, nationalistic cause. Mm. It has been always something else. For someone else's yeah. intentions. And uh, what I find most revealing is the fact that we haven't been asking the right questions about this. For instance, during World War I, mm -hmm. uh, the Assyrian groups that participated in armed struggle uh, alongside the Allies, mm. they were really successful in their warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, comparing uh, uh, relative to their numbers, they were outstanding. Yeah. So. And then we see that they, in, in May 1918, when the, uh, the Turks uh, or the Ottomans uh, accepted defeat and mm. the basically World War I was yeah. over, we see that these forces just stopped mm -hmm. operating. They mm. just dissolved directly. Mm. Uh, as soon as the British support or the f external support stopped, yeah. it's like having uh, some kind of r robot or machine where you, you, you press the button on and then you press off yeah. Uh, so it's, it, it doesn't have its own uh, motivation or its own power mm. or agency. Mm. Uh, it, it's dependent upon someone else uh, giving it support or you know, pushing it forward. So it's really interesting that it, 100 years has, has passed since then and I haven't found any Assyrian asking, but why did our forces dissolve? Why did we stop fighting? Because the British, they had reached their strategic goals uh, the French, they had reached their strategic goals, yeah. everyone else, we hadn't. So why did we stop? Yeah. Uh, I would like to um, uh, a quote uh, from your book about this uh, subject, where you say, um, we must bitterly acknowledge that no Assyrian has really fired a single shot for Assyria. The claim is likely shocking to many within the Assyrian movement. This is really shocking. I mean, a lot of people would not just be shocked in a, in a good way. They will be mad or they will be angry that this is not true. How could you answer why, why, they, why this is a big shock for people? Yeah, because uh, it's, I said, it's a tough pill to swallow. And uh, uh, I remember when I wrote those exact words, uh, I was thinking that th this, this will be shocking and this will be, uh, uh, you know, people will not accept it, mm. uh, or at least some will not accept it. It's difficult mm. to accept, but this is the hard uh, reality. Yes. Uh, this is how it is. We haven't uh, fired a single bullet, bullet uh, on our own for our own cause. We've always fired the bullets uh, in some other context for some other, other reason, mm. uh, for some other agency, yeah. not our own. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm happy to be wrong. Mm. If, if someone could prove me wrong, show me when during our modern history we've really actually fought mm. entirely on our own and entirely for our own cause, nothing else. Uh, there's no other um, directive or, you know. Uh, yeah. And the reason behind this is also the collective victimhood mentality. But when did this uh, mentality developed. I think there's a, f a full chapter where you talk about when did this mentality started or how did it develop and why do we still feel this way? Why this mentality or this concept just d just went or vanished for us? It is, is still, why does it still exist in our um, thinking or our mentality? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's r relatively easy to pinpoint when uh, could have started. Uh, you just need to look at our history and see, because if you say that uh, collective victimhood means powerlessness, you feel uh, you're powerless, you don't, mm. you lack agency, and you feel you're dependent upon others, then the opposite of that is when you have agency and you feel powerful and mm. you act and you have an inner drive, uh, sort of. 
And uh, the last period in our history where we see we have some kind of dynamics within us is uh, when there was a, like, um, uh, the Assyrian churches were very active in spreading Christianity mm. and, and culture and um, uh, language and everything associated with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the co go last golden period. That's the last time we see uh, us as a nation, mm -hmm. uh, although stateless, but still uh, very dynamic and very uh, outward looking and very powerful, able to organize uh, amazing, an amazing um, project of spreading Christianity in, uh, in, in Asia mm -hmm. uh, and far places. So, after, after that, you see a period of massacres and pillages uh, coming uh, our way. Yeah. And afterwards, uh, the massacres and the genocides uh, continued for four or five hundred years. It, it was a very dark and intense period. And then afterwards, you don't see any more dynamics. You don't see any initiatives. You don't see any, anything that could point to uh, us feeling, uh, any group of Assyrian feeling powerful or mm that they could uh, change their destiny or, or you know, uh, af affect their destiny. So uh, I think we've been, I think we've been in this state uh, for a long time, uh, at least for five, six, seven hundred years, more or less. And I think we've been, uh, it's not a static uh, mm -hmm. state. It, mm -hmm. uh, it always depends on the input. Mm -hmm. So every time there's a genocide, every time there's a massacre, every time there's some kind of uh, oppression on a daily basis, mm. it, it gives, uh, it's an input. It, it stimulates the coll collective victimhood sense uh, and it reinforces it. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we fell into this state and we've not been able to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, and we've only uh, gone deeper and deeper because we've suffered more and more uh, oppression and different hardships. Yeah. Uh, we may heard all the time that the saying of it is our fault or we will not reach Assyria because we are not doing anything. We know this, but interesting enough that there's a lot of pioneers, Assyrian pioneers, who mentioned this before that we are the reason for not going forward. It is in our hand that we are just stuck in the in the past or not moving forward. And you came along and you just pinpoint the name more. And why do you think that uh, that you like you put your voice with there and you agree with them uh, with them and you quote a lot of them, uh, like a lot of these Syrian pioneers who have like really. Uh, mentioned this before. So what is the difference between now and then? And can you tell us more about this coating method that you made about from those uh, Assyrians? Yeah, so uh, You know the the observation of us uh, um, Waiting for a savior or being too dependent upon outside forces. It's it's it's, uh, it's nothing that I've come up with mm. other Assyrians have, have uh, observed this mm. And actually, they observed this almost from day one. We have uh, quotes from Assyrians like uh, Jack Gorek, who was living in Paris during World War One, who wrote very eloquently uh, to his nation, uh, you know, demanding that, mm. uh, like, wake up, we need to act our, on our own. We should stop uh, waiting for the British or the French or uh, for decisions being taken in Paris. Uh, we have to uh, do it ourselves. We have yeah. to rely on ourselves. And you see continuously other Assyrians, uh, perhaps before him, but certainly after him, uh, have been saying this more or less. Uh, mm. Different Assyrian leaders uh, have been se observing this. And you have also uh, uh, a lot of uh, quotes from different Assyrian personalities who have observed that we suffer from something. Mm. Uh, you see Ashur Yusuf, uh, who was uh, one of the first victims in the genocide, uh, writing an uh, entire article trying to pinpoint why, uh, mm. as a nation, why aren't we progressing? Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, he was comparing a lot with Armenians because mm. there were a lot of Armenians living in Kharput, the town he was living in. And so the question has surfaced from mm. time to time with different Assyrian uh, leaders uh, asking them. But I think what I bring to the table is this uh, perhaps more scientific uh, approach and 
This hasn't been a uh, available for people like Jacques Gorek or others uh, because no one knew about collective mm. victim audits. Mm. Relatively recently, it has been discovered. So, uh, you know, Jacques Gorek, 100 years ago, he was a uh, little bit accusing his mm. country uh, men of being uh, lethargic. Mm. Uh, they're just lazy. Mm. Uh, it's the uh, typical Middle East laziness mm. that's uh, stopping us. Mm. Others have said that, you know, it's just uh, ignorance or lack of understanding that we have to invest our in ourselves mm. and not the others. Mm. I say that no, now we know it's not laziness or it's not actually ignorance either. Mm. It's, it's this mental, psychological state we've been forced into, not of our own free will. Mm. Uh, and we're not the only nation to suffer, suffer from collective victim. And you, you see, it's very, it has been very prevalent among Jews, mm -hmm. uh, p uh, po Polish people, uh, Yugoslavic po people, and more or less every nation that has suffered a great amount of traumas in their past. Mm -hmm. But the, the degree to which a nation is uh, suffocated by this uh, state is uh, relative to the uh, uh, amount of oppression mm. or trauma they suffer. So we have suffered much more and much more intensely and uh, under a specific time period mm. than others. And uh, that's why we've uh, found ourselves really deeply, deeply uh, within this uh, state and so deep that we have been unable to really see clearly mm -hmm. that it's dictating every way we are behaving and thinking and acting. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think th this is the yeah. the, the missi missing puzzle, uh, piece of the puzzle. Yeah, but I have to say that even though that we might be called, like there's some, a lot of um, um, claims made, like if, uh, if the reason is of is uh, laziness or it's if it's ignorance, but there have been a lot of Assyrian political movements um, and they all like asked for unity and they asked for our rights even though they did not reach or they did not succeed you also say that in your book and you say that unity is just like a waste of time it does not give long-term success why is that what is why if though we don't have unity then what is the other solution for that? Yeah. So I think uh, unity is, is a manifestation mm. of a behavioral pattern that is dictated once again by, by collective victimhood. Mm -hmm. Our focus uh, on unity as a political movements comes from the idea uh, mm. that if we are united, then we will get help. Mm -hmm. outside help from outsiders mm. and it's been told once time after time that the reason why no one is helping us like mm. a big nation coming to our rescue is because we're not united mm -hmm. if we are united then we will get help so it's it's dependent upon s once again this thinking of of uh, uh, external savior or mm -hmm. external uh, help mm. uh, and that in, in turn is dependent upon mm. uh, you not seeing that you have your own destiny in your ha hands. Mm. Uh, we cannot sa save ourselves, someone else has to save us, mm. and therefore we have to be united. And the, the reason why help hasn't come is because we're not united. And all of mm. this is, is, uh, is, is not true. It's just something we, we've uh, taught to believe, uh, and we're not, we haven't been questioning this, mm. uh, this mantra, but it's completely false. It's historically false because most nations, if you read mm. uh, political history, most nations don't unite through you know, agreements or, yeah. or uh, concessions. Mm. Most nations in a nation building process, you, usually mm. they are pretty bloody. And yeah. uh, it's, it's one group forcing their terms on the others. And uh, hence you see uh, uh, within many years you see a na nation being mm -hmm. created that way. Many, many, many nations have really uh, bloody histories. Uh, they are very, I mean, united today and comfortable, but it hasn't, there's a stretch to that and that, that you usually is not like we uh, envision. Mm -hmm. So this narrow focus on unity is also false. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe unity comes uh, through success. Mm -hmm. Success creates unity and we have examples of this a little bit in our modern history as well.
Yeah, uh, I do agree on uh, with you, but we have to admit that nowadays there is such thing called words powers, and these word powers are a salvation for many. Uh, we see that in uh, Iraq they are demanding for uh, the Ninwe planes, they want their independence, and those things are not happening because the war powers are not with us, or they are not on our side. So how can we just say that, oh, it's just victimhood mentality, whereas there is this fact of war powers that with their uh, agreement could establish or finish as a, a minority or a country. So what is your comment on that? I think the, the world is very complex. There's not one world power or a certain amount of world powers that dictate anything or everything in the world. Mm. So it all boils down to uh, self-reliance. Uh, a nation's success depends a lot on the uh, level of self-reliance, the mm. amount of self-reliance. So, and self-reliance doesn't mean that you don't seek partnerships and um, cooperation. Um, or and having allies. Or having allies mm. uh, in, you know, um, having a project and then seeing who can you work with on this project mm. because there's always a m mutual benefit mm -hmm. uh, to, to all different politi political projects. So w sometimes this is easily m misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, are you meaning that we shouldn't ever uh, ask for help or you know uh, work with any mm. any other group? No, it means that uh, the starting point should always be self-reliance, and then you should always seek uh, partnerships and um, uh, with others based on that. Mm. And I think you c you will not find any any you will not get get any help if you're not if your uh, starting point is not self-reliance, yeah. because no one wants to work with a group who don't even believe in themselves or in their own project. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, believing in, in oneself and uh, knowing what you want and having a project, mm -hmm. pushing forward with your own project, that's when you're going to um, uh, catch the attention of, of others who might benefit from your project. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way we have done it till now is we, we're just standing still and just saying uh, we need you to rescue us. Without giving any offers for the other part. Without acting more or less ourselves, we're just crying for help. Mm -hmm. And that's not really interesting for any any power. Yeah, it's true. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I came across uh, a word which is progressive Assyrianism. It is mentioned um, uh, just one time in the book, but I was really interested to this concept. What do you mean by progressive Assyrianism? And I do believe that it may convey the message of the book. So what is progressive Assyrianism? What is about what is it what it is about? Yeah. So I felt that uh, the the book conveys a message uh, not about uh, only collective victimhood. It it goes deeper than that, and it offers a broader uh, analysis of our situation, our past, and uh, our future. And I think uh, I felt that it would uh, be good to have uh, to describe this new uh, mindset or. Uh, these new I these new ideas mm. in a, in, a, in a with a term, so I think of uh, uh, traditional Assyrianism. That's the principles and ideas that have guided our work mm. as a, a nationalist movement uh, for the past 100 150 years, and I think that we need uh, a new ideology or not new way of thinking and. Um, uh, that's why I came up with the term progressive Assyrianism because I think on every point. Uh, this new way of thinking is is more progressive. Uh, it it um, offers uh, a new take, uh, different solutions mm. on uh, old dilemmas and questions. So uh, I think it it can summarize the the thinking in that term. So um, in the book you have or you have made your analysis. You have given your arguments and the claims that support your argument. And then we come to um, uh, to the conclusion, maybe, or the result, which is the progress of Assyrianism. And you say that there is indeed a path to Assyria. What is that way? What is the path? Uh, what is this conclusion that you have reached? I think uh, that we, as a nation, uh, need to look uh, inwards first mm. of all. And I think the entire book is about it, uh, about our inner. Uh, mm. selves mm. 
mm. uh, uh, people engaged in the movement and other Assyrians, uh, it starts always within. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, our failures are also because of what, what's been within us, mm. in our minds. So that's the real work. That's where it starts to change the minds, to, to get new insights, to reevaluate, uh, and to ask the right questions mm. and to seek answers without filters uh, or preconditions. And so that's the path to Assyria, I would say. To, to it starts within us, and then I think it will automatically lead us on, on the right way, on the right path. We have so. Um, it might the book sound a little bit gloomy or a little bit depressing for many people. Why do you think people should read this book? Because I think it's a hopeful message, actually. Uh, in deep down. Although, although most of the book is depressing yeah. uh, in, in, in that it, it totally deconstructs uh, much of what we've uh, thought of ourselves and seen ourselves as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, the national, so-called national struggle we told ourselves that we've waged. Mm. Uh, but still, I think the overall, the message is, is a message of hope, uh, a message uh, of uh, that bears uh, a lot uh, of uh, hope for the future for the entire nation. Mm. So I think people uh, should read it maybe just to uh, allow th themselves to be challenged. Yes. Especially if you've been engaged in the national movement and if you if you feel something for your people and your nation and you've been somewhat somewhat uh, asking yourselves why are we scattered all over the world and why do, don't I see any progress and uh, uh, what's our future? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this could be um, uh, an, an interesting read. I have to say that I am one of the people that who lost their hope in the, our cause and the Assyrian cause. But reading this book uh, gave me a new way of thinking. And this is what I think that people would gain from reading this book is that they will change their way of thinking they will change their perspective for things not just being um all the time like you said or mentioned earlier just being weak but either is giving us another way to think or look at things and maybe start to make a real change and i do now have hopes which is this is a really good thing for me i did think that the book even though it might be very harsh for many people or even for me um it in the end it did give us some like a silver lining that there is something uh, that we can make just when we start to look at our thing to our issues differently not just like you said um just being depressed and waiting for salvation mm. um i have to agree with it with that i really Thank felt you. this yeah. um the book has been out for last summer since last summer and um, this is my reflection on the book. How did the people who read the book give you their reaction? What, what they were thoughts about the book? I've uh, received uh, a lot of uh, praise for it actually and uh, people find it interesting. Um, the ones I've heard from and the ones I've, I haven't heard from, I, of course I don't know, perhaps mm -hmm. they didn't like it so much, but uh, in any way I, I think uh, it's just good to, as you said, to, to allow yourself to have another perspective. Uh, it's mm. not a uh, white or uh, black issue. There's, there are many nuances and um, there are many uh, ways to, to um, appreciate or understand mm. our national uh, cause. And so, um, yeah, overall positive, I would say. That's good. Mm. And you, the book uh, is in Swedish and English. And are you thinking about translating to another version? Yeah, it's uh, being translated uh, to French. Hopefully, it will be published in French uh, next year and also in German. Mm. And uh, we're looking to have it, having it translate also to Assyrian, uh, Arabic, Turkish, and hopefully Russian as well. That's really nice because there is many Assyrians around the world and I think the book m needs to be published out there in the world. Um, if someone wants the book, how can they order it and do you ship all well around mm -hmm. the world? They can order it from uh, tigrispris.com mm -hmm. and uh, uh, 
yeah, from all over the world they can order it. Yeah. There. Well, thank you uh, for your time, and I do appreciate you being here with us today. And again, uh, congratulations on your book. Is there any last message or any word that you want to share with uh, our viewers? Thank you very much, and uh, I hope we uh, all can have an open mind and, and educate ourselves on our issues. And uh, there are many great books uh, mm. uh, written by Assyrians, and uh, so keep reading. It's really important. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone who is watching us from home. Stay safe and see you next time.